Thank you for joining us for this look at some of the best stories from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Coming up, Republican politics in San Diego, the latest in our Public Matters series, looks at the dramatic change for the party and local government in recent years. The role of safe parking when it comes to the housing crisis meet a local family benefiting from a local program that aims to provide some stability and more from our investigation on cross-border fentanyl smuggling. How has the surge affected overdose deaths in San Diego? And we have a lot of pub political news for you this week, starting with how we vote. Governor Gavin Newsom recently vetoed a bill that would have expanded the number of languages offered on ballots. KPBS Gloria Penner fellow Elaine Alfaro says that bill faced pushback from election officials who were concerned about the costs. Translation and language services can look like a lot of different things, but in the context of voting, it's simple. Receiving voting materials in your first language. This access has come a long way since the National Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. That law said there should be translations at the polls, but it only applies for Spanish, Asian, Native American, and Native Alaskan languages. California has since built on the national law to include more languages. In San Diego, that means an additional four languages. But also we've seen at the local level in California, some leading municipalities like San Francisco and Oakland that have also passed language access laws and policies, San Diego as well. So we've seen this proliferation at the local level as well. That was Jacob Hofstetter from the Migration Policy Institute. He studied language access law across the nation. But those voting materials and languages required by state and local laws aren't on the actual ballots. Instead, they're on reference ballots. That doesn't necessarily translate to equitable voting access, according to Diana Kitamura from the Asian Law Caucus, who are one of the sponsors of the bill. She says people don't actually get a ballot in their language to vote on. But the language assistance is very limited. So what they're entitled to is what's called a facsimile ballot. What that is really is a translated reference ballot. And so you can't actually vote on it. And that's where this new bill was supposed to help. And across the board, we heard that the facsimile ballots, the translated reference ballots, they were better, better than nothing, but they were confusing, uh, difficult to use. The bill aimed to get rid of those reference ballots and require actual votable ballots in different languages. Rahamo Abdi from Pana San Diego says that could have made a huge difference for the communities that she works with. So when they're comparing the English ballot to Somali ballot or the Arabic ballot, it was very difficult. So that's why it's so important for this AB884 to, to get us a, a votable ballot. But election officials had qualms. Jesse Salinas is the president of the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials. So we'll like double the amount of languages we would have to be able to provide. And one of the true challenges that we would have is translation. He said technology, vendors, and funding couldn't meet the bill's new requirements. What we've calculated is if you start just to reprogram that in L.A., they did uh, an assessment. It's going to cost in L.A. over $25 million. The San Diego County Registrar of Voters declined to comment on the bill, but says even offering reference ballots takes a lot of work. With our budget and the time available and the technology we have and the languages that can be supported by our, our vendors, we follow the law of the state of California and the federal law. But Abdi still saw this bill as the next step. Instead of really comparing facsimile ballot to the English ballot or just using community members or their kids to go vote, this should be a fundamental right for everyone. Abdi said the veto of AB 884 was a missed opportunity for justice, but she says she's not giving up. Elena Faro, KPBS News. And if you want to get an early start at studying your ballot, sample ballots are now available from the San Diego County Registrar of Voters. And those of you who get email alerts got yours this week. You can also go to the Registrar of Voters website, which is sdvote.com, and you can just enter your address. And from there, you can review your particular ballot and the voter information pamphlet. The November election wouldn't be possible without the help of poll workers, of course. KPBS reporter Tanya Thorne says the San Diego Registrar of Voters is looking for help, especially from those who are bilingual. Poll worker turnout has been positive. 
But the San Diego Registrar of Voters is still looking for more. We are looking to recruit roughly 2,500 poll workers. And of course, we would like to have a good presence of bilingual poll workers at all of the voting locations. Sean Brom is an assistant at the San Diego Registrar of Voters. He says there's a big need for bilingual poll workers. The county currently is seeking poll workers, bilingual poll workers specifically uh, in 10 languages uh, of interest specifically right now is the Filipino, Vietnamese, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Laotian. Brahm says having bilingual poll workers can ensure a better experience for many voters. And so when the voter goes to a vote center and they're able to see somebody from their community uh, that they recognize, they feel comfortable, they're able to ask questions and understand the voting process in their preferred language. He says the county embraces our diversity and wants all voters to be informed. It's a two-day training process for poll workers, bilingual or not. So no experience needed. We'll definitely get everybody trained. And uh, again, it, it's, it's good to have the bilingual poll workers out there for the comfort level. Polling centers begin to open on October 26 and will be located around the county. Poll workers receive a stipend of $145 for each day worked and $240 on election day. And if you're a bilingual poll worker, uh, and you, if you're a bilingual speaker, you'll receive an additional $5 stipend uh, for each of those days and $10 on election day. So it's uh, about helping the community being uh, civically engaged and also receiving a stipend. Anyone interested in being a poll worker has until the end of October to sign up on sdvote.com. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. Public Matters is our new collaboration with local news outlets focusing on democracy. And that includes our Why It Matters segment with Voice of San Diego, Scott Lewis. And this week, he tells us about how San Diego lost its place as a Republican stronghold and why it matters. <music> I've been reporting on San Diego politics for the past 20 years, and this is the first election cycle where no Republican is even running for an office in the city of San Diego. All the candidates for mayor, city attorney, city council, they're all Democrats or nonpartisan. Just four years ago, several members of the city council and mayor were Republicans. Now, none. San Diego used to be a more conservative city than most any in California. Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan loved it here. Reagan's last campaign rally of his entire political career was at Fashion Valley in November 1984. It's great to be in San Diego, my good luck city. What happened? Can Republicans ever come back? San Diego's local races are technically nonpartisan. But parties can help candidates raise money and send mailers about their endorsed candidates. Republicans really started to lose traction about 16 years ago when Barack Obama was elected president. Then Donald Trump won. And in San Diego, Trump was not popular. San Diego County voters supported President George W. Bush's re-election by just more than 50% in 2004. But 16 years later, President Biden beat President Trump in San Diego County by more than 60% in 2020. During that time, Democrats learned all they had to do was tie a local candidate to Trump and they could doom that candidate. Take City Councilwoman Lori Zaff. Zaff was running for a re-election in a coastal district in 2018, two years after Trump won the presidency. Incumbents like her almost always won re-election. But Democrats and labor groups inundated voters with messages connecting her to Trump and she lost by 15 points. This year, we're going to see a new test. Former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, one of the last Republicans in city politics, is running for county supervisor. He hopes to oust an incumbent, Democrat Tara Lawson-Reamer. And now Lawson-Reamer is doing the same thing. This is a billboard she put up in Ocean Beach. Here's why it matters. If Faulkner wins, the Republicans have a chance to regain the majority on the county board of supervisors, which they had for decades until just four years ago. Meanwhile, the split has shifted. Many business groups have shifted focus and support more conservative Democrats. Will they continue to do that? Will the Democrats just fight amongst themselves? Or will the Republican Party rebuild here? We asked the executive director of the Lincoln Club, Victor Lopez, 
what local Republicans should do. But what needs to happen, if you want Repu if Republicans want to win elections uh, in any race, not just city of San Diego, everywhere else, uh, you have to have infrastructure and you have to have community uh, community name ID and you have to be able to have issues and, and representations that are best aligned with the district that you're running for. Um, Democrat or Republican, if you don't have infrastructure, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have good community backing, you're going to have a really tough time getting elected. So that's the first thing to watch on election night, that county supervisor race. If Faulkner wins, the Republican wins, maybe former President Trump no longer is holding back local candidates. But they've got a long way to go before Republicans refer to San Diego as their lucky city ever again. I'm Scott Lewis, and this is Why It Matters. And this segment is part of our Public Matters initiative with Voice of San Diego and iNewsource. You can find stories, events, and more at kpbs.org slash public matters. And sign up for our newsletters to get a list of our most popular stories. Here are some from this week. Most of the Imperial Beach shoreline reopens to the public after a lengthy closure. The San Diego City Council declines to renew its contract with ACE Parking. And two new memorials are dedicated to those lost in the 1978 PSA crash. We'll have that story a little bit later. Safe parking programs have become a countywide method to lift people out of homelessness. Many participants are homeless for the first time. Supporters say the programs catch people before they've lost everything. Katie Anastas has the story of a family who lived in a safe parking lot for more than a year. We'd been homeless for three years, four months, and 13 days. Keaton Carrier and her family became homeless after they moved back home to San Diego in spring 2021. Carrier says a state welfare program that helps families with children paid for 60 nights at hotels. After that, odd jobs helped her and her partner, Joshua Coulter, pay for hotel stays. Then, one day, they saw a news story on TV about Jewish Family Services' safe parking program. And we've seen it on TV, huh? And yeah, I'll call them people right we've now. seen it on the news when we were in the hotel. And he called them and he said, come right down, we have a trailer for you. They'd spend the next year and three months living in that trailer at one of the program's sites. Welcome. Carrier has two sons. They're seven and eight years old. They had two birthdays here. June and July is their birthdays. And I would decorate, it's called the birthday fairy. We've been doing it ever since we were homeless. Um, we take streamers and we decorate, like they were hanging from the ceiling. We had things on the door. Just where they woke up, they woke up to it. Happy birthday. Now the family hopes to celebrate birthdays in their new apartment in Ramona. Coulter has a new construction job there and rent is a little over $1800 a month for a two bedroom apartment. Jewish Family Service paid their deposit. I'm not an emotional man but like I got it. I felt good. I felt it. They're also buying them furniture, silverware, and other things they need for their new home. The boys will have bunk beds with Spider-Man and Marvel bedding. Well, it makes us feel like, wow, it's almost like encouragement to continue to stay out. Out of homelessness. Jewish Family Service operates four safe parking sites in the city of San Diego, with more than 230 parking spaces total. The city is spending $4.6 million on the program this year. Mayor Todd Gloria says they fill a critical gap in the city's shelter system. Jesse Mendez directs the safe parking program. He says it's rare for them to have an empty spot. Um, we do have a high population of, of older adults that are on fixed income and retired or, or, or on like disability of some sort. Um, but the vast majority of our clients work every day. Case managers work at each safe parking site to connect people to housing and other services. They also try to reunite people with family members who can take them in. The benefit of safe parking is you get to intervene at a level where people haven't really lost all their hope. They haven't lost all their possessions. A lot of our clients are first time homeless. UC San Diego researchers studying the program in 2022 found that many clients wanted more flexible access to the lots. Two sites are now open 24 hours, the other four just in the evenings and early mornings. Clients also wanted more access to meals and showers, more case management, and help overcoming racial bias when seeking housing and employment. Since 2018, the program has served more than 5,000 individuals and 3,000 households at six sites in San Diego County.
Jewish Family Service says more than a third of them have moved into more secure housing, including permanent housing, hotel rooms, and shelters. If a client misses one night at safe parking, I encourage myself to call them the next day to find out what happened. Nine times out of ten, the client was just, oh, I just found a friend or whatever. But you know what the most response that we would get when you call someone the next day? I didn't think anyone cared where I was at. And guess what? They come back because we care. People at safe parking and safe sleeping sites are considered unsheltered in the annual point in time count. Gloria has asked the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to reclassify them as part of the sheltered homeless population. He says the unsheltered homeless count would have dropped by nearly 10 percent this year instead of increasing. And he says it would reflect the role the sites play in connecting people to services. Mendez says part of that role is giving people hope. You know, it's never over. You know, it's only over when we tap out. That's Carrier's message to other homeless parents, too. This is just a season. Like, I'm going to cry, but it, you haven't failed those children. It's just keep going, because once you give up, that's when you fail them. Earlier this summer, the California Coastal Commission approved a plan to turn a site in Point Loma into a safe parking lot. It's expected to open early next year and nearly double the number of safe parking spots in the city. Katie Anastas, KPBS News. And we have more from Katie Anastas on help for families who are trying to keep pace with the cost of living. She recently visited a new food pantry that serves military families. Brianna Van Dyke and her family moved to San Diego from Texas. She says the move came with some sticker shock. A Little Caesars pizza here is $11.47, and in Texas, it was $6. Van Dyke supervises recess and lunch at Hancock Elementary School. Her husband is in the Navy. This school community has been there for us through lots of different hardships. Now the school has another way to support them, a food pantry. Wednesday marked its second food distribution. It was amazing. It wasn't just um, a bunch of canned goods thrown in a bag. That's usually what we end up finding at different food resources throughout San Diego. Um, this time it was great because it was a mix of things that kids actually eat and want to eat. Hancock Elementary is one of the latest schools in San Diego County to get off feeding San Diego's wait list for a school pantry. Nearly all of the students there have a parent in the military. We did a needs and assets assessment about two years ago and we found that a lot of our families found food security to be difficult. So uh, they wanted more snacks in the classroom and they wanted food, food resources for them to use at home. Military members' housing allowance counts as income when applying for CalFresh. The San Diego Hunger Coalition has called for it to be exempt from income so that more military families can access that benefit. Feeding San Diego staff say school pantries can reduce the stigma of seeking food assistance by bringing it to a familiar, trusted place. For a lot of families, it's already on their day-to-day -day path, and so it makes, it, the, makes the food a lot more accessible and it, just a lot more convenient. Feeding San Diego now distributes food at 44 schools in the county. More than 30 others are on the wait list. The organization says it costs about $30,000 to run a school pantry for a year. They'd need nearly $700,000 each year to take the remaining schools off the wait list. Katie Anastas, KPBS News. Fentanyl use in San Diego County has skyrocketed in recent years, but the number of fentanyl overdose deaths has begun to inch downward. KPBS border reporter Gustavo Solis has the story behind these trends. San Diego's proximity to the border makes it a key part of the fentanyl supply chain, and it's likely to stay that way, according to the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of California, Tara McGrath. We are a transition point for the arrival of fentanyl, and what I mean by that is that we're a transportation hub. The fentanyl comes in through the Mexican border and then transfers up to uh, distribution hubs like Los Angeles and uh, Las Vegas and then gets distributed to the rest of the country. Now it's inevitable that some of that supply stays in San Diego, feeding the local demand for fentanyl with tragic consequences. Overdose deaths have skyrocketed in San Diego County from less than 100 to more than 800 in recent years. It's a grim reality 
that San Diego District Attorney Summer Stephan is all too familiar with. We've made fighting fentanyl a priority because we are ground zero for it. But there are signs of hope. For the first time since the fentanyl crisis began, the number of overdose deaths has leveled off and even began to go down. San Diego uh, sort of uniquely has shown a 7% reduction in the number of fentanyl overdoses in 2023 as compared to 2022 and 2021. Yet, with nearly 750 fentanyl deaths countywide last year, Stefan is hardly celebrating. Instead, her office and public health experts are studying a shift in how people use the drug and what that might mean for the future. So while in 2019, 2020, we never saw cases where somebody was seeking or asking for fentanyl, now in 2024, we have many cases where the victims ask specifically to get fentanyl. April Ella is the director of operations for A New Path, a drug treatment organization based in San Diego. She says there's been an evolution in how people use fentanyl. Just a few years ago, most people took it by accident. People who are searching for fentanyl, where they start maybe trying to get like a Xanax or that was laced with fentanyl, they realize fentanyl's in it. They might get a little bit more addicted to it, drop the whole Xanax portion and go towards fentanyl. Experts tell KPBS that fentanyl is now much easier and cheaper to get in San Diego than heroin. Advocates credit the drop in deaths to the overdose reversal drug naloxone, which goes by the brand name of Narcan. But fewer overdose deaths does not necessarily mean fewer overdoses. Ella says that non-fatal overdoses are extremely difficult to track. If they didn't go to the hospital, or they didn't get arrested, or they didn't get, you know, some, some sort of um, care of some sort, even calling, like, you know, a helpline or something like that, there's no way to really track how many people are overdosing every single day. And despite the lack of reliable data, a new path has seen more demand for naloxone, which suggests that more people are overdosing, or, at the very least, are at risk of overdosing. When we're out in the field, people will report, oh, I use three of those kits. I use three of those kits on my brother, whoever, you know, my, my, my roommate, something like that. But that doesn't mean that gets reported anywhere. Prosecutors agree that the naloxone is making a difference, but they also credit increased collaboration among law enforcement agencies. Federal prosecutors work closely with the FBI, DEA, Border Patrol, and local law enforcement to go after large drug smuggling operations. Identify and dismantle the cartels. That's what the U.S. Attorney's Office does. That's our unique piece of the puzzle in fighting fentanyl and other narcotics. District Attorney Stefan says tougher drug sentencing laws are also needed. Meanwhile, advocates like Ella say that would be a return to failed policies of the war on drugs. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. And this is another in a series of stories that's focused on separating fact from myth regarding migrant crime and border security. You can watch all of the related stories on our KPBS YouTube page. Just click on the News Features tab. This week marked 46 years since a deadly commercial plane crash in North Park. John Carroll says family and friends of those who died have now reached a decades-long goal. On the north side of St. Augustine High School this morning, chimes sounded, a call to remembrance. To memorialize this tragedy, we have create, we've created this prayer garden for our community. A prayer garden anchored by a beautiful memorial, 144 hand-painted tiles, one for each of the lost, the tiles bearing muted versions of PSA's red and orange colors. It was a glorious, beautiful sunny day that day and we were talking with hundreds of saintsmen milling around in the quad as you still do today. For some reason Father James Clifford looked up and saw something terrifying. A Cessna coming up and under the PSA Boeing 727. Then they collided, the horrifying sight turning to terror on the ground. It was coming right to us and that was a, another moment of like, are we going to survive? St. Augustine students, along with former students, some of whom were here that day, family members and friends of those lost, listening as this memorial was dedicated. This prayer garden is certainly beautiful and will preserve the history of this event and give all of us a place for quiet solitude. 
46 years, and in the space of one day, we go from no memorials to two. This one at St. Augustine High School. And here at the intersection of Dwight and Nile, where 46 years ago, PSA Flight 182 slammed into the earth, the Cessna landing just a couple of blocks away. Here, finally, a plaque dedicated to the 144 souls who lost their lives on that awful day. Among those on the PSA plane that day, several flight attendants making their way home to San Diego. Marla Scavia was one of them. Her mother, B. Turkel, remembers it like it was yesterday. I was at work when this occurred, and when they told me, I said, oh no, my daughter's not on that flight because I knew she wasn't working. Turkel turned on the news when she got home, and then came the awful realization that her daughter was on that flight. For her and the other family members and friends of those lost, it's been a long time waiting for a memorial. It finally happened due to the work of council member Stephen Whitburn and his staff. He promised a year ago that a memorial would be placed within the year. The clouds have parted, the sun is shining, uh, and I think it's symbolic of the weight that has been lifted off the family members who now have a rightful place to come and mourn and remember those who we lost. On the basalt stone of the St. Augustine Memorial, there is an inscription. Part of it reads, may the memory of the deceased and all who served that day and the days that followed be eternal. With the two memorials, the hope of that fond wish is now more real for those left behind, whose lives were forever changed on September 25th, 1978. John Carroll, KPBS News. And we hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Tripulsi. Thank you for joining us.